number of things to go over. Um, we'll be covering the basics of hydraulic filtration, uh, some common um, terminology and, and items with uh, regarding hydraulic filtration, as well as uh, an overview and just a, a quick um, run through of, of the breadth of product line uh, offered by Molly uh, Industrial Filtration. So we'll, we'll start. I know uh, many of you are, are familiar with Behringer and some may not be too familiar with Behringer. So I wanted to start with a brief introduction to Behringer and, and the products that we offer. Um, and then we'll get into the Molly Industrial filter, Filtration products, uh, beginning with the benefits of filtration, why you want um, filtration, why it's needed in hydraulic systems, uh, some common terminology that you'll hear every day when uh, talking about um, uh, filtration. Um, and then go into the sources and effects of contamination. What, uh, what is the dirt, um, particulate contamination, water contamination, what does that do to uh, components within the system? And uh, uh, finally, location and sizing and selecting filters. Why do you want to use a pressure filter versus a return line filter versus an offline filter? So hopefully uh, by the end of the seminar we'll get um, uh, give you a better understanding of uh, why to use certain filters in, in certain locations. But to begin with, uh, Behringer Corporation um, has been manufacturing tube and pipe clamps that uh, secure and re secure hydraulic uh, process tube and pipe and hose and also uh, reduce noise, vibration, and shock of um, of the hydraulic lines, and we man manufacture these here in the our New Jersey uh, facility. And uh, the, the clamps come in various sizes, from various sizes and styles, from standard series, heavy duty series, uh, uh, twin series, where you have uh, consistent center to center distances uh, for for tandem runs. We also manufacture and offer a full range of hydraulic um, and air and process filtration interchange filtration products. Um, these go from, you know, it's, we, we began um, uh, 10, 12 years ago manufacturing hydraulic filtration, but have since expanded into um, compressor filtration, coalescing filtration, uh, process filtration. So we have a, a wide variety of uh, interchange elements for, for many different industries. Again, here the Behringer uh, brand name includes the, the tube and pipe clamps that you can see, and uh, also uh, the interchange filtration elements. Uh, some of the other things that Behringer offers is high-pressure ball valves. These are manufactured by a company called Ruttelmann out of uh, Germany, and they manufacture high-quality two-way, three-way, multi-way, um, high-pressure ball valves. Um, Cartridge valves, they have a complete line of uh, shut-off control technology, as well as some instrumentation valves. Um, these are available in steel, stainless steel, up to, uh, I think they're high pressure, highest, ultra high pressure goes up to about 30,000 PSI. But the standard press, high pressure ball valves goes up to about 7,000 PSI and uh, used a lot in um, uh, mainly hydraulic, but uh, other industries as well. And the Mali Industrial Filtration, that's what we're going to be focusing on a little bit here this morning. Some of the, the brand names and competitors you'll see out there for some of our products, uh, like on the clamps, you'll, you'll hear the name Stauf, uh, Hycon, Hydag, ZSI. Uh, if you run across a customer that is looking for any of those brand names, we have um, direct or functional interchanges to many of those, um, many of those competitors. Uh, ball valves, same way, Stauf, Hycon, Hydac, Anchor, DMIC, we've got um, replacement valves for those. And uh, filters, a lot of the common filter manufacturers uh, that you'll see is Paul, Hydac, Parker, uh, Donaldson, Purelator. Uh, those names in um, manufacturers we have uh, functional and or direct interchanges to as well. So when you're out in the field, uh, a lot of the common names we can uh, interchange and supply a similar product for uh, your customers. And that covers the, uh, an overview of, um, of the Behringer. Um, Molly Industrial Filtration is uh, a large company, and, and in their industrial filtration group, 
uh, their product line is set, uh, separated into three segments. They have their hydraulic line, which is what we're going to focus on mostly today. They have their process filtration line, and as you can see in the, the center picture here, uh, this particular item is, a, is an automatic back flushing filter that's typically used for machine tool coolants uh, to remove um, the uh, chips and metal contaminants out of uh, machine tool coolants for uh, water filtration, whether it be raw water out of a river or cooling tower water on top of a building. Um, and a lot of other industries, uh, these are used in food industry to filter chocolate and uh, chocolate and paste and peanut butter and, and some um, uh, oils, uh, lard, some um, uh, pretty much any, any flowing fluid um, you can use the Molly automatic filters for. And even on, on some like heavier oils or uh, more viscous fluids, uh, they're available with heating jackets so you can maintain a certain viscosity to keep the, uh, the fluid. But they're all self-cleaning filters which um, will trap the contaminants on the element and then once it becomes dirty, it goes through back flushing or a um, scraping cleaning cycle to discharge the contaminants through the discharge valve. And the third area is their dust filtration. Um, they have complete dust collectors for, uh, you'll see these a lot of times on the outside of buildings or inside buildings to remove the airborne dust uh, due to certain processes. And these are, again, are, are self-cleaning with a variety of different technologies. Uh, could use a multi-jet nozzle or a rotating wing technology to clean the dust off the elements. And this is similar uh, to a Donaldson turret, and um, they're probably one of the, the most common that you'll see in the industry. Like I said, we're going to focus on the hydraulic filtration. And uh, to get started with the hydraulic filtration, first of all, you know, you want to understand why you need quality filtration. And uh, there's a number of benefits of uh, using quality filtration. The first being you increase the service life of the fluid. You'll be able to use your uh, uh, fluid, your hydraulic oils, much longer by maintaining quality filtration. Um, you reduce the risk of premature component damage or failure by um, keeping the dirt out of the oil. Your, your valves are going to last longer. Your pumps will last longer. It reduces repair and replacement maintenance costs, so as long as the more uptime you have with that machine, you know, the less time you, uh, you need to spend repairing it or replacing or maintaining your more expensive components. You minimize the downtime of production, and that's uh, very important, especially in uh, today's uh, economic situation. The, the customers are um, running leaner, and they want to keep that machine running as, uh, as long as possible to uh, improve um, the cost of the components and um, uh, the overall production. The machine reliability, again, by maintaining the, filtra the filtration, you um, have much more reliable equipment. Increases the lifetime of servo valves and proportional valves and, and high pressure pumps. They're um, very expensive, and by maintaining your, your oil quality, you have um, much greater lifetime of the critical and expensive components. Some terminology that we'll be talking about today and that you hear uh, regarding the filtration. Uh, first of all, when you're talking about a hydraulic filter, what does it include? Uh, the first part is the filter housing, which could be constructed out of aluminum, steel, plastic, some sort of iron. And this is the, uh, the device that's actually installed in the hydraulic line. Um, and it contains the filter element and contamination indicator. The filter element is the device that actually d provides the filtering of the fluid. It's either disposable or cleanable, um, and it's, the, the, it's included in the housing, and it's the device that, can, that traps the contaminants within the, uh, the mesh. Contamination indicator is also called a clogging indicator. And this is a device that alerts the operator as to when to change the element. It could be um, 
simple visual pop-up type indicator. It could be electrical. It could be a, a proportional type indicator to, to show you the, the, uh, the rate of change or how dirty or how contaminated the filter is on a proportional um, basis. And then there's a bypass valve that could also be included in the filter housing or the filter assembly. And that's a safety device that prevents uh, catastrophic failure of the element. Um, it, off, it allows for, uh, it'll open up and you'll get unfiltered flow through the filter housing when the element um, needs to be changed and the operator hasn't changed it yet. So um, if you continue to run fluid through the, a dirty element, you do run the risk of the element collapsing and then a lot of the contaminants escaping and going downstream. So in some cases, and this is an optional device, in some cases it's better to have unfiltered flow than to um, have the element uh, potentially become damaged and release all the contaminants. In other areas, uh, you don't want a bypass valve, um, depending on the type of system and the critical components. Typically, in servo valve systems, you don't want to have a bypass because it's uh, highly dirt sensitive. And you would, in that case, you would put a an element in that can that can handle a much higher delta P or differential pressure. And um, uh, so if the operator doesn't change the element when it's required, you have uh, an extra safety factor so the element does not, uh, does not become damaged. And in that case, you would rather have um, a more expensive element than allow for unfiltered flow downstream to the, to the sensitive components. And here's a diagram that just shows uh, the filter housing is actually has a uh, couple of devices. You have the, the filter head, typically, and a filter filter bowl. And in pressure filters, you'll you'll typically see see it like this, where the head is uh, in the up upward position and the bowl that would hang down. But there's many other configurations. The filter element, like I said, is the device that that uh, traps the contaminants. Here's the optional bypass valve that goes into the head and then different types of nation indicators. You have a pop-up, an electrical. Sometimes uh, you can just plug that and not have a contamination indicator. But it is recommended to at least have a, have a pop-up indicator. You'll hear micron whenever you uh, select a filter. You um, need to know what micron the filter needs to be, and that's the size of the particle that the filter is designed to remove, uh, the minimum size. And uh, obviously, the larger particles will also be removed from uh, from that filter. But a micron is short for a micrometer, which is one millionth of a meter, or 0 0.000039 inches. And what um, to give you an illustration of what size that is. Um, there's a chart below that shows a grain of table salt is around 100 micron. Human hair is about 70, the diameter of human hair. And the smallest of, that the human eye can see is about um, 40 micron. And when we're talking in uh, hydraulic systems, we're trying to remove particles that are 3 to 20 microns. So they're, they are particles that are uh, invisible to, uh, to our eyesight. And here, um, the, reason, the reason we need to remove those small particles, this shows uh, some of the orifice sizes within uh, typical hydraulic components. A vein pump uh, between the vein tip to the outer ring, the uh, clearance is a half to one micron. Gear pumps are about um, a half to five micron. Um, piston pumps, servo pumps, you can see all, or servo valves, you can see all the different um, uh, orifices and, and tolerances within those components. So we're really removing very fine particles uh, from the hydraulic fluid in order to prevent the damage of these components. Beta ratio is a term uh, that's also very important. Um, and this you'll see a beta ratio for a given size particle, say a beta 10 is the number of particles upstream of the filter compared to the number of particles downstream of the filter for that 10 micron size. 
So in this diagram, if you have 100,000 particles, 100,000 particles upstream of the filter, and 50,000 particles downstream of the filter, you can see you have 100,000 upstream divided by 50,000 downstream gives you a ratio of 2. So it's, it's really only containing 50% of the particles. So it's really not an efficient filter media. But on the other side, if you have 100,000 particles upstream of the filter and 1,000 particles downstream of the filter, that gives you a beta ratio of 100, which in turn uh, equates to 99% efficiency which is 1 minus 1 divided by the beta ratio times 100. So you can see um, in typical fluid does contain many, many particles of 10 micron uh, and larger. So this, uh, the more efficient the media is, the less particles that escape downstream and the higher your beta ratio. So you'll see right now, um, it used to be, according to the old um, ISO classification, that a uh, typical absolute rated filter would have at least a beta ratio of, of 75. Now the norm is um, the, the quality has improved, and you want to select a filter that has a, a beta ratio of 200. And these beta ratios are determined under laboratory conditions and uh, you know your efficiency does decrease a little bit under um, uh, operating conditions but it gives you a way of of comparing this filter to that filter so if you're comparing a, a filter that has a rated beta ratio of a thousand to a filter that has a beta ratio of 75 um, you know you're not really getting the same quality filter medium Now the sources of contamination, where, where does the contamination come from that we're trying to remove in the, the system? And that's, um, there's three main types of, or sources of contamination. There's what we call the primary contamination, which is the dirt that's associated with insulation. The operating contamination is a contamination which occurs within the system. And then there's the uh, ingress contamination, which is brought in through the environment and through external factors. And we're going to get in a little more detail on this. But the primary contamination, which is associated with installation again, is this is the contamination that's found in components. When you get a, uh, buy a product, um, customer gets a product that's, you know, stored in a warehouse or shipped, um, in cardboard box. I mean, you're going to have some dirt that's just going to get onto the um, uh, onto the component itself through the assembly process. You're going to wipe off some uh, fittings with um, with rags, and you'll get uh, fibers and, and uh, detergents and other things on the um, on the fittings. You'll have welding residue from the manufacturing, paint residue, again fibers, metal shavings, and one of uh, one big area for the primary contamination is new oil. Uh, new oil, a lot of uh, customers think that new oil is clean when in, in, in fact it's um, probably uh, one of the uh, dirtiest uh, or the areas that, that gets most of the contamination in the system or a lot of contamination. So as you can see here, this is an illustration that just shows uh, location of filters and sources of contamination. To just reiterate what we just talked about, you have the built-in dirt just from putting the, you know, just from the assembly process itself. You'll have uh, built-in dirt in the inside the reservoir. You'll have uh, uh, areas where welding, um, you'll have welding residue from uh, the assembly process. Fittings from putting the, the system together, you'll, you're going to get dirt in uh, when you install valves and actuators. Um, you get a pump, you get uh, <clears throat> paint residue from, from new components that you put on. And uh, new oil is also, like I said, one of the dirtiest. Here you can see this is a uh, 100 times magnification, and one division is about 20, is 20 micron. And here you can see that we have uh, some very small, fine particles. 
as well as some uh, some larger particles. You know, we're talking 20, 50 micron, um, and some even larger. So this is a, a actual sample of, of new oil. So that's one area that um, uh, a lot, like I said, a lot of customers think the new oil is clean when, when really it's, uh, it's very dirty oil. So that must be, or should be filtered as you're filling, filling the reservoir. Operating contamination, and this is the contamination that occurs within the system, and that's generated through abrasion and, and through wear. And one of the uh, key areas for generating contamination is your pump. You've got, uh, say if it's a gear pump, you've got gears um, uh, meshing together and grinding together, and you have abrasion and wear from the gear contact. Um, other areas, in, in other types of pumps, you're going to have metal-to-metal -metal contact that's going to be um, have abrasion and, and wear associated with it. So a pump is one of the main contributing factors to uh, contamination within the system. Other ones are, uh, are valves. Valves, you have the sliding surfaces, proportional valves, directional control valves. You've got two sliding surfaces, metal on metal. And if you get contamination within the, um, uh, the orifices within the, the valves and you get the sliding forces with a piece of uh, hard contamination in there, you can chip, um, chip the spool or chip the housing, which creates more contaminants. So, so if you have contamination within the system, um, a valve could generate more if that um, hard contaminant gets caught within the sliding surfaces. So it's more of a, a snowball effect that one piece of contamination can cause a lot more throughout the system. Contamination ingress. This is the external factors that, that brings in the contamination. And this could be... Um, uh, one main area is brought in through cylinders. Every time that cylinder rod retracts, you're going to be, uh, I mean, it does have rod wipers and things, but there needs to be a certain amount of clearance for that rod uh, to be able to move in and out of the, uh, the cylinder, uh, cylinder housing. So when the dirt accumulates, you get airborne dirt that accumulates, uh, sticks to the oil that's on the cylinder rod, and when the rod retracts back into the cylinder, it... Um, brings that dirt into the system. Faulty seals and any components or any fittings could, uh, could bring in airborne contamination. Uh, dust and dirt in the air. And like we talked about with uh, filling or topping off the fluid with new oil, if it's not filtered, that's uh, another area that contamination is brought in through external factors. Machine washdown could get dirt, water, dirt and water into the system, which um, uh, waters, we're, we're talking mainly about particulate contamination, but, um, but water contamination is just as, uh, as critical. So here, uh, to reiterate again, the cylinder rods is an area to, that brings in contamination into the system. New oil topping off the hydraulic reservoir. Uh, the air breather, if it's not properly maintained, is, um, can allow for airborne contaminants and dirt on the on the hydraulic tank to get in. And here you can see some some breather filters um, on typical hydraulic reservoirs. If you can look to the one on the on the left, the top of the tank is not not uh, very clean, so a lot of that dirt can get in into the um, into the reservoir through breathing if you don't maintain the element in there. Uh, this particular breather over here. As you can see, it's not properly mounted and there's a lot of, uh, there's a big gap underneath it. So first of all, a lot of times filler, these are uh, filler breathers that should be replaced, but um, in a lot of cases, the customers don't know that that's a replaceable item. So you, you have um, a filter inside there that filters the air going in, in and out of the reservoir. If that's not replaced, you're going to get uh, uh, contamination in through into the breather. Plus, if it's not properly installed like this one, here you can get a lot of these metal, metal chips right into the reservoir, which can cause uh, catastrophic failure. Now, the same diagram, but this time we'll focus on the location of filters and uh, why to use each type of filter 
and also at the same time I'm going to go over a uh, a review and go through the Molly product line to show you uh, on filters what's available, what type of mounting, just uh, quick examples of, of different filters through the Molly product line. But the first uh, first one here is an offline filter. That'll be the last filter we're, we're going to speak about today, um, but that's um, one location. You've got pressure filters, which are very common. Um, return line filter, where if there's no other filters on the uh, if there's no other filters on the on the system, the return line filter is uh, should be there. I mean that's that's it's a lower cost filter um, and it, it serves serves a very good purpose. So a lot of times you might have a system that only has a return line filter and doesn't have a lot of the others. Inlet line filter, also known as a suction filter, which is before the pump. and the filler breather cap or breather filter. Now the suction filter is located um, located before the pump in the suction line and its purpose is to remove the contaminants in the oil in the reservoir and it's supposed to protect the pump. The, the, the main reason for that is to filter contaminants that's sitting in the, in the bottom of the tank before it gets into the pump which is a critical component. Um, there's a lot of there's uh, there's some controversy about suction filters in the in 20 years ago they were used very commonly but uh, but today they're not used as much because there's more there are some negatives associated with the suction filter yes you're you're protecting the pump but because you're in the suction line you can't have much restriction in the line or you'll um, uh, run the risk of cavitating or having pump cavitation and starving the pump of oil. So a lot of times the, the suction line filters are only coarse filtration just to get the large um, nuts and bolts out of the oil before it gets into the pump. Um, if you have a very fine filter in the suction line, you'll have too high of a pressure drop and you'll, you won't be able to um, get the oil required by the pump and you'll starve the pump of oil and, and run into a cavitation problem but they are still used in, in certain applications. So if you look at the Molly filter product line, um, here's a suction strainer, which is very common. Um, instead of having a uh, entire filter, you can just have a suction strainer on the, uh, the line in the, in the reservoir. And typically this is a 100 or 200 micron. And it's available in various sizes. PI-160, here's a uh, complete filter housing, which um, to this one thing with, with the suction strainer is there's no way to know when to, when to change it or when to clean it. And it's located inside the reservoir, so you, you really don't see it. It's one of those out of sight, out of mind type of filters. But by going with a um, suction filter that has an indicator and it's mounted on, on top of the tank or on the side of the tank, at least you know when, uh, when it's time to change the filter. There's another um, example. And also you can use uh, spin-on filters, uh, certain spin-on filters in the suction line. Pressure filters, uh, the location of um, uh, pressure filter, this is installed in the pressure line after the pump and before the dirt sensitive valves and uh, critical, critical components. And this, uh, the pressure filters are designed to remove wear contaminants in the oil that's generated by the pump. We, we talked earlier that a pump is also one of the areas that can generate contamination through abrasion and wear. And a pressure filter is designed to remove the contaminants that are generated by the pump and also to protect the valve components and uh, actuators downstream. And there's a lot of types of, um, of filters. Let me go back to that last one. You can see that there's low pressure filter and high pressure filter. Um, in the Molly product line, there is um, uh, quite a number of pressure filters. And these are designed you know, based on the type, um, the pressure rating, as well as the, um, uh, the mounting configuration and um, size. There's a lot of... Uh, A lot of different the, the, the head down at the bottom, your inlet and outlet straight through, 
and the bowl um, in the upward position. PI 200, again, uh, available in many different sizes from low flow up to uh, 120 gallons a minute. And there you've got uh, uh, flange or threaded connections. PI 210 is a duplex filter. And the advantage of duplex filters is that you can run continuously. You can change out the dirty element while switching the flow over to a clean element. And you can change the dirty element without shutting the system down. Um, simplex type filters, you've got to shut the system down, change the element. Um, and uh, then be back up and running. With a duplex filter, uh, you can you can do all that. Continue the flow of fluid without shutting the system down, and while changing the filter element out. Spin-on filters uh, can also be used in low pressure line, as well as a um, return line filter, which we'll get into in a little bit. PI two thirty is a high flow or a um, a lubrication filter for high viscous fluids. It's um, uh, 39 inch element or 16 inch elements, very large elements with dirt holding, large dirt holding capacities. PI270, we saw this one earlier, that can be used in the suction line, can also be used in a, return, a, a low pressure line. We've got some high flow, low pressure filters that can handle um, uh, hundreds of gallons per minute. Different types of uh, spin-on with flange connection, flange mounting patterns, and inline um, flow. This has uh, another filter that has large dirt holding capacity, low pressure, low flow. And then the PI-281. These are typically, you'll see these in, in heavy industry, in steel mills where they might have a central, uh, central hydraulic power unit that goes out to different manifolds throughout the plant. But in the central reservoir that's feeding all those systems, you have one large uh, inline filter to filter the oil as it's coming back into the reservoir. Medium pressure filters, same way. There's many, uh, many options available. Here's uh, medium pressure high flow. This filter divides the flow between the two filter housings, so you can have a, um, a higher flow without having an extremely large filter with a very heavy bowl. Uh, the problem with um, when you get into the medium and high pressure filters is when you get to very high flow rates, uh, the bowls are made out of uh, steel or iron. And for an operator to change a uh, very large filter, it's, um, it's heavy and it's cumbersome and it's you know, hard, to, hard to screw up the bowl. So here we use a moderate size bowl, but just put two filter elements in it or two filter bowls with elements. Uh, to increase your surface area and your flow rate capabilities. Manifold mount to um, minimize the space required. If you can mount the filter right on the side of the manifold, you reduce the space required. PI350, another inline style filter, similar to the PI360, very similar filters. This is a, one of our most common, uh, common filters is a 3000 PSI inline type from uh, very uh, low flows up to pressures of, or flows of 120 gallons a minute. Duplex filters, again, in, in a medium pressure. And this is a, a smaller uh, mobile or OEM type. Uh, this is a, a high quantity um, filter we use for, uh, for certain OE, OEM applications. And uh, high pressure. One of the things, um, uh, advantages of the, this PI410 is um, in certain components, servo valves and proportional valves in particular, um, you really want to filter the fluid as close to the most sensitive component as possible. That way you have less fittings, less area for um, contamination to get into the filter or get into the, the, the valve. So here this one mounts directly in between your subplate and your your most critical component. And so it filters the fluid directly before the fluid gets to, uh, gets to the valve. So it's a big, it's a stacking filter um, available in uh, your DO3, DO5 patterns. And um, uh, it gives the most protection of that particular component. BI420 is a high pressure 6,000 PSI filter. Again, available up to um, 120 gallons per minute and uh, smaller sizes as well. And this is a very common filter, uh, 6,000 PSI. Flange connections, threaded connections. 
Okay, 422 is another 6,000 PSI that has an L-shaped flow pattern. Small PI430, lower flow filter. PI440 is a uh, top mounted manifold mount. Again, uh, reduces the, the space required. You don't have to plumb it in line. It's right directly from the manifold. High pressure duplex filters. Stainless steel high pressure filters. And uh, an inline type uh, low profile filter. So that goes through a lot of what's available, not, to, not everything in the product line, but it gives you a good, good understanding of the pressure filters and what, the, uh, what types are available through the Molly product line. Some other uh, location of filters uh, is the return line filter, and this is installed right in the, the return line before the reservoir. A lot of times it's mounted uh, directly on top of the tank as flange mounting and the bowl uh, goes in, inside the reservoir. It removes, this is designed to remove the contaminated contaminants generated in the system through the abrasion and ingression. We talked about the valves uh, with the sliding surfaces possibly generating its own contaminants. And also we talked about the actuators, the cylinders and motors bringing in contamination through, uh, through the atmosphere. And um, return lines are designed to get the contaminants out before it goes back into the reservoir. And it's designed to, um, uh, keep the um, the reservoir clean or the oil inside the, the tank clean. And so if there's if there's no other filters in the system, you might just have a suction strainer and a return line filter. The advantage of a return line filter is that it's lower pressure and it's lower cost. So if the customer can't, you know, if he's looking to um, protect this, give the system some protection um, and, and can't um, afford many of the filters, then the return line is is a lot, of, a lot of the times what the OEMs will, um, will put on just one filter. And here you can see the PI500 or 5000, as it's called, the, um, is a, uh, a filter that's a tank top mounted filter. And here's the mounting flange. So you'll have that part above the tank and the rest of this inside the reservoir. So all you'll see it's a, uh, from the top of the tank is, is this part. This is, you have your inlet coming in this way and the outlet drains right down into the bottom of the reservoir. And again, this is available in many different sizes uh, from very small up to um, uh, almost 300 gallons per minute. PI510 is a duplex filter that is the um, same style. It's, it's two of the PI500s put together. But again, you can switch the flow from one filter housing to the next and uh, change out the one filter without shutting the system down. PI530 is a smaller filter. can be used in industrial and mobile applications. And some of the advantages of this uh, filter is it's, um, it's a smaller, uh, only up to uh, about 15 gallons per minute or 20 gallons per minute would be the largest size. But some of the advantages of this one is you could put, um, have the built-in breather right on the filter housing. You can have a fill port on the filter, so it can be used for filling, uh, for breathing, and filtering the return line. So it's a multi, multi-use filter. The PI500, some of those sizes as well, could have fill ports and uh, breathers built right in. Now the breather filter, also called the air breather, sometimes it has a filler on it, called a, so it would be called a filler and a breather, or a filler breather. And this is installed on the tank top and removes the contaminants from the air as air is drawn into the reservoir. So what happens is uh, every time the oil level changes in a hydraulic uh, reservoir, that oil level goes up and down, and the air is also either pushed out or brought in um, with the change in the, res in the um, liquid level. So as the air is coming in and out, you want to make sure that air is filtered so you don't contam further contaminate the oil. And uh, there's many different styles and types depending on your airflow rate and the size of the reservoir. But we, uh, Molly offers um, uh, one's uh, filler breathers that have um, plastic or metal housings with replaceable elements. Some have indicators on to let you know when to change them. Others do not. Um, 
and there's just different options. There's options of media. Again, you can have uh, paper medias or medias that remove oil mist as well as contaminants. So uh, a lot of things to consider there. The larger ones are for larger reservoirs that have much more airflow through the housing. And the last location of filters that we'll talk about is uh, the offline filter. Um, this is also called, uh, sometimes called a bypass filter or a kidney loop filter. And this operates independent of the system. It's got its own built-in pump, motor, and filter. Sometimes it also has a cooler. And it just, uh, its job is to recirculate circulate the fluid in the reservoir to continuously um, clean up the, the oil in the reservoir. And a lot, it has a lot of advantages, the, some, of, some of which are uh, the independent operation. It has, like I said, a built-in pump motor combination. So it doesn't operate off of the system uh, pressure. So independent operation. It can be run even when the system is shut down or uh, totally independent of the system. It's the most efficient form of filtration because it's just a constant steady flow. And it has no flow surges, no pressure spikes. Um, nothing associated with, uh, you know, cylinders going in and out and, the, and different flow rates. Uh, the, uh, the filter is a low pressure filter. The housing is low pressure, so it has lower cost elements. Um, again, it can be operated when the main system is shut down, so you can continuously filter the oil in the reservoir. Uh, typically, you want to have a large filter with large dirt holding capacity, so you don't need to change the element as frequently. Um, by keeping the oil in the reservoir clean, or clear, by using a kidney loop or an offline filter, you increase the service life of the elements, your system elements, your high pressure filters, which are more expensive. Um, and you can also, it's recommended to have a finer micron rating on an offline filter than what's required by the system. So if you have um, a servo valve system that requires three mic or, or a proportional valve system that requires 10 micron filters, you can put a three micron filter or two micron filter in the um, in the kidney loop. It can also be um, uh, it can be stationary, permanently mounted, like this PI fifteen thirty five built in pump motor and filter with high dirt holding capacity, or you can have a mobile portable unit that's on a cart that you can wheel around from machine to machine, and it's um, uh, basically you can filter you know one shift filter machine number one, next shift take it over and filter machine number two. So there's a lot of advantages, and like I said, this is the most efficient form of filtration um, because you know it's, it's operated independently and everything is uh, regulated. But uh, obviously, on, on the ideal situation on a hydraulic system is you would want um, uh, you know a suction strainer perhaps and a pressure filter and a return line filter and an offline filter. But um, uh, you know, obviously, in the real world, we know that. Not every system is going to have every type of filter. However, that would be the best. Um, you would be able to maintain and have um, all the benefits of, of every filtration. Some of the things when we size and select the filters, now hopefully you have a little bit of an understanding on, on where they're used and why you want to use suction, why you want to use pressure. You know, uh, But some of the, uh, the sizing and selection criteria is the um, where you're going to put it, suction pressure return line. What type of connections do you need in the system? Is it a flange, manifold, NPT, stacking filter? And to properly size, we need, at, at minimum, we need uh, the operating pressure. We need the operating temperature, uh, the flow rate, fluid type, and viscosity, and uh, the micron or the cleanliness class desire. Those are like the minimum things that we'll need in order to properly size the filter. Um, it's kind of hard, and, and we do get requests. Um, you know, somebody will call up and say, "I need a I need a one-inch filter." Well, we we can give you a one-inch filter, but there's many different sizes for that. So we try to get, at minimum, the pressure, um, flow rate, temperature. It's typically, in most cases, the same. So if we don't have the operating temperature, that's not as critical. But pressure, flow rate, fluid type are at minimum what we need, and the the micron cleanliness. So that was kind of a basic overview of, uh, of hydraulic filtration. And um, 
and the Molly Molly product line. We appreciate the time, and and we're going to be having another another seminar in a few months, which is more of an advanced filtration, which uh, will go into much more detail than what we had here. This is, like I said, a, a the basic course and a basic overview. But I appreciate the time, and uh, if there's any questions, um, you know, let us know and. Um, I think Sean has got a couple other things we just want to touch on here before we before we dismiss. But again, thank you for your time. Yep, there's just, um, before we go, one more thing that I want to show everyone, and um, that would be our, uh, our, our website. I just want to direct everyone here quickly. If you can see here uh, on our, our website, we have uh, uh, links for the online training and the upcoming webinars that we're going to have. There's this um, starburst that's up at the top, and then also on the left-hand side, for anywhere from our, our website, you can click on this online training button. And when you do, it'll bring you to a list of, of upcoming webinars, and we update this kind of frequently. Right now, we've got the one that we're in today uh, so far, and then the next one that we're, we're doing uh, as far as product specific will be an introduction into our sanitary pipe supports. After that one, um, after July, uh, for the remainder of the year, uh, we're going to do one a month um, of more advanced, as Scott was mentioning, more advanced, more in-depth technical training on the products. The uh, one next month on the sanitary hangers is going to conclude all of our basic webinars that we've already done, and then uh, we'll move on to our advanced courses. Um, now you can see below, it's kind of hidden, but if you click here, you can join our mailing list to be on the list for all the upcoming webinars. And if you've missed any of our webinars, on the top of this page, there's this little icon that looks like a video camera. If you click on that, that'll take you to a page with a, a list of all of our previous uh, webinars. So you can see here all the basic courses that we've already done. We, we did one on uh, Behringer's interchange filtration products. We did one on the CH series of clamps that are, are new, kind of an introduction. We've done one on ball valves and we've done one on our industrial pipe supports. Uh, so you can go here and with these links you can either uh, right click on it and you can save it and you can save that program to your desktop uh, and then watch it at any time or you can view it live, uh, well not live, but you can view it off of our website and it'll uh, you know, be able to launch in a Windows Media Player or some type of uh, program like that. So that's kind of, uh, I just wanted to let everyone know a little bit about that um, and feel free to go on our website and, and register and, and check back. We'll be updating it soon with all of the advanced courses um, and also be sure to get on that mailing list if, if you'd like to and as we add the advanced courses, we'll send you an email notification just to let you know that it's there. Um, so that kind of concludes everything that I had for today and uh, thank you very much for your time this morning and hope to see you in one of our future presentations. Okay, thank you.